In understanding black Africa, geography is more important than history. Fernand Brodel In a strictly geographical sense, all the peoples on the continent of Africa are Africans, from the whites of South Africa to the Arabs of the Mediterranean states. But the term has in practice come to refer primarily to the indigenous peoples of Africa below the Sahara, to black Africans. The basis for this focus is not simply racial, but historic, cultural, and geographic as well. As with the British, the Slavs, and others, the influence of geography in Africa has not been simply in its effects primarily on things, natural resources or economic prosperity, for example, but on people. More specifically, the effect of geography in making cultural interactions more difficult has been particularly striking as between the peoples of sub-Saharan Africa and the outside world, as well as among themselves. To their north is a desert more vast than the continental United States, and to the east, west, and south are the Indian, Atlantic, and Antarctic Oceans. Moreover, the smooth coastline of sub-Saharan Africa has offered few harbors which ocean-going ships could enter, and in many places the shallow coastal waterways have meant that large ships could not get near the shores. Ironically, for centuries, much of the world's international trade was carried in ships that sailed past West Africa on their way between Europe and Asia around the southern tip of the continent. Seldom did they stop. Partly this was a result of wind and ocean currents that made return trips between Europe and sub-Saharan Africa difficult or not economically feasible in the era of wind-driven ships at least until far greater knowledge of those currents and of alternative routes developed. Relatively little of Africa's trade entered international commerce. In the era before the modern transportation revolution of railroads, automobiles, and planes, which is to say, throughout most of human history, the geographical barriers surrounding tropical Africa have been formidable, though not absolutely impenetrable. The consequences have been not only economic, but cultural. As the eminent French historian Fernand Brodel put it, external influence filtered only very slowly, drop by drop, into the vast African continent south of the Sahara. The geographic barriers to economic and cultural exchanges within various regions of sub-Saharan Africa have been formidable as well. The most striking of these barriers has been a dearth of navigable rivers or streams, though the land itself also presents difficult terrain in many places in the form of escarpments and rift valleys. The net effect has been that the peoples of sub-Saharan Africa have historically been insulated not only from the peoples and cultures of the outside world, but also from one another. Among the cultural consequences has been a linguistic fragmentation of tropical Africa, which has made African languages one-third of all the languages in the world, even though African peoples are only about 10% of the world's population. This linguistic fragmentation has been only one aspect of cultural fragmentation in general, including tribalism and many religious differences. In much of sub-Saharan Africa, a combination of geographic features has had unfavorable, if not devastating, consequences for economic and cultural development and tragic consequences for the vulnerability of black Africans to outside conquerors. One of the remarkable facts about the African continent is that, despite being much larger than the continent of Europe, its coastline is shorter than the European coastline, indeed, shorter than the coastline of any other continent, even though Africa is second only to Asia in size. This anomaly reflects Africa's lack of the numerous coastal indentations which form natural harbors in Europe, providing places where ships can dock, sheltered from the rough waters of the open seas, thereby enabling European countries to become maritime nations early in their history. In addition to a dearth of harbors, parts of sub-Saharan Africa have shallow coastal waters, so that maritime trade has often had to be conducted by the costly method of having ships anchor offshore, with their cargoes being unloaded onto smaller vessels, which could then make their way to land through these shallow waters.
Africans have generally not been seafaring peoples, except in the Mediterranean or in parts of East Africa where these geographic constraints have not been as severe. Much of Africa, and especially Sub-Saharan Africa, has developed without the benefits of a large maritime trade and the consequent stimulus of economic and cultural interchanges on a large scale with various and disparate peoples. While there has been for centuries some trade between Sub-Saharan Africa and Europe, or with the peoples of North Africa and the Middle East, international trade has generally played a relatively smaller part in the total trade of Africa, as compared to other continents, not only because of a dearth of harbors, but also because of a dearth of navigable rivers reaching into the interior of the continent from the sea. River mouths opening into the sea have been blocked by sandbars in some places, and in other places the few good harbors have been connected to hinterlands that were not very productive, and so have had little to offer in trade. Thin coastal plains, averaging only 20 miles in width and often backed by steep escarpments, have likewise provided little basis for large-scale international trade, even where other conditions might permit it. Low and irregular rainfall over many parts of Africa fill rivers and streams to a navigable depth only intermittently, and even when filled, many rivers and streams are navigable only by smaller boats or barges, not ocean-going vessels. Where the volume of water is sufficient for navigation by sizable vessels, the many rapids and waterfalls of Africa still impede international trade. The Zaire River, for example, is 2,900 miles long and has a volume of water second only to that of the Amazon, but its rapids and waterfalls near the sea prevent ocean-going ships from reaching inland. Thus, the role played by other great rivers of the world in facilitating the development of ports that became great cities, contributing to the economic and cultural development of the surrounding lands and peoples, was denied the Zaire by the intractable facts of geography. Nor is the Zaire unique among Africa's rivers. No river in sub-Saharan Africa reaches from the open sea to deep into the interior. On the Mediterranean coast, only the Nile reaches far inland. Significantly, the Nile spawned the most famous of the civilizations developed on the African continent, as well as the two largest cities on the continent, Cairo and Alexandria. Except for the Nile, Africa's rivers that are even seasonally navigable tend to be concentrated in equatorial West Africa, which has produced larger and more advanced societies than in many other tropical regions of the continent. In short, the peoples of Africa, like the peoples of Europe and Asia, tended to develop urban centers and larger cultural universes around navigable waterways. There have simply been far fewer of them in Africa, which has been and remains the world's least urbanized continent. Among the relatively few things which have had sufficiently concentrated value in a relatively small physical size so as to be able to repay the high costs of transport from Africa, have historically been gold, ivory, and slaves. All three became major exports. The coast of what is now Nigeria became known as the Slave Coast, just as the coast of neighboring Ghana to the west was called the Gold Coast, and that west of Ghana was, and still is, called the Ivory Coast. One indicator of differences in access to waterways is that, while more than a third of Europe's landmass consists of islands and peninsulas, only 2% of Africa's landmass consists of islands and peninsulas. Such disparities in access to waterways are accentuated when the navigability of these waterways is also taken into account. Even the Niger River, the heart of a great river system in West Africa, draining an area nearly twice the size of Texas, is not navigable everywhere by large vessels, and is not navigable at all in some places because of rapids. At the height of the rainy season, the Niger may become a 20-mile-wide moving lake, but, during the dry season, the average depth of the Niger can in places fall below 4 meters. Despite its serious limitations, the Niger compares favorably with other African rivers with even more serious limitations. The Niger has been characterized as the easiest to navigate in all of tropical Africa. Navigating the Niger's chief tributary, the Bainway River, for example, 
has been more problematical. Because of seasonal rainfall patterns, the upper Bane Way has been navigable only two months of the year, leading to hectic and complicated shipping patterns. If they let the craft stay up the Bane Way a day too long, the vessels will be stuck on sandbars for ten months. Yet, if through caution or misinformation they withdraw the fleet too soon, much valuable merchandise is left behind and can only be evacuated by land at much greater cost. The first boats to go in are the commercial canoes, then follow the larger craft, and finally, when there is sufficient water at Lakoja, the largest power craft and their barges sail up the river as fast as possible. Towards the end of the short season, the large craft have to come out first because of the fall in the level of the water. The medium-sized craft follow, and the small canoes may continue for some time evacuating small quantities of produce. Drastic changes in water levels are common in other West African rivers and streams. The Senegal River has been characterized as precariously navigable, and only during some months at that. Like the Niger, the Senegal is not only subject to large seasonal changes in water flow, but also contains rocks and rapids. In East Africa, such rivers as the Zambezi are navigable only for relatively short stretches. One reason for the drastic seasonal changes in water levels in African rivers is that tropical Africa is one of the few large regions of the world without a single mountain range to collect snow, whose later melting would supplement rainfall in maintaining the flow of streams and rivers. Rivers in tropical Africa are wholly dependent on rainfall, and that rainfall is itself highly undependable, not only from one season to another, but also from one year to the next. The term navigable can of course mean many things. In some of the rivers of Angola, for example, it means navigable by boats requiring no more than eight feet of water, and in parts of West Africa during the dry season, even the Niger will carry barges weighing no more than eight tons. By contrast, ships weighing 10,000 tons can go hundreds of miles up the Yangtze River in China, and smaller vessels another thousand miles beyond that. Aircraft carriers can go up the Hudson River and dock at a pier in mid-Manhattan. Navigable rivers in Africa seldom mean anything approaching that. Even the Nile was unable to handle the largest vessels in Roman times. Moreover, because so much of tropical Africa consists of high plateaus, almost the entire continent is more than 1,000 feet above sea level, and half the continent is more than 2,500 feet above sea level, African rivers must plunge greater vertical distances to reach the sea, making them less navigable en route. While the Amazon River falls only about 20 feet during its last 500 miles to the sea, the Zaire River drops about 1,000 feet in 250 miles as it approaches the sea. As a geographer has put it, the African continent is cursed with a mesa form which converts nearly every river into a plunging torrent. However impenetrable much of the interior of sub-Saharan Africa may have been to large ocean-going ships, the continent's coastal waters have been plied by smaller boats, which could and did go inland as well, being unloaded and carried around waterfalls. Shipments from ocean-going vessels could also be loaded onto smaller craft for transportation into the interior on rivers. Local waterborne traffic between inland locations was likewise possible by carrying boats and their cargoes around rapids and waterfalls. Sometimes these boats and cargoes were carried from one river to another, thereby expanding the reach of commerce. For example, an overland route requiring 25 days of porterage on land connected the Niger and the Senegal rivers in centuries past. Moreover, even rivers beset with cascades and waterfalls may have navigable stretches that add up to considerable distances, hundreds of miles on the Senegal and more than 1,500 on the Zaire, even though these are not continuous distances. Thus, the various regions of Africa were not hermetically sealed off from one another or from the outside world, but both the volume and the variety of trade, as well as the distances involved, were nevertheless severely curtailed. 
in comparison with more geographically fortunate regions of the world, where heavy and bulky cargoes of coal, ores, and grain could be shipped long distances in continuous river and ocean voyages. A late 20th century comparison of the transportation costs of grain in several Asian and African nations found that these transport costs were a higher proportion of the total price paid for grain by consumers in Africa. Moreover, such statistics do not capture the effect of transport costs on grain that was never shipped in the first place precisely because higher shipping costs would have made it prohibitively expensive. Contemporary transport costs also cannot capture the handicaps created by even higher transport costs in Africa before many of the transportation advances from the rest of the world were introduced in the 19th and early 20th centuries and before African harbors could be dredged by modern European equipment and Western railroads built. While it is true, as an historian has said, that a considerable portion of West Africa was part of a hydrographic system that was ultimately connected to the Atlantic, the limitations of that system are a part of the story that cannot be omitted without serious distortion. Moreover, the distances between the interior hinterlands and the open seas are greater in Africa than in Europe, for example, while the means of covering those distances are much more limited by geography in Africa. In Europe, no part of the continent outside of Russia is more than 500 miles from the sea, but a substantial part of tropical Africa is more than 500 miles from the sea, and a portion is more than 1,000 miles from the sea. Only Asia has a larger interior area remote from the sea, though Asia has more navigable rivers connecting its interior with the coast. The geographical positions of African rivers must also be taken into account. Although the Niger River originates just 200 miles from the Atlantic Ocean, it circles far inland before eventually turning back toward the sea and covers 2,600 miles before actually reaching the ocean. In general, the tenuous connection of the African interior with the sea has been one of the major geographical barriers to the economic, cultural, and political development of the continent south of the Sahara. Land transportation in large regions of sub-Saharan Africa has also been made more difficult because of the prevalence of the tsetse fly, which has carried a fatal sickness that has affected animals as well as human beings and made the use of pack animals and draft animals impracticable in many places. Denied this aid to land transportation, Africans often carried bundles on their heads in colorful caravans that were reflections of the bleak alternatives left to them without the help of either the waterways or the animal power available to other peoples on other continents. Expensive transportation provided by human beings limited what could be carried, how far it could be carried, and how fast. In addition to the physical limitations, there were narrower limits imposed by economics as to what items contained enough value in a relatively small space to repay the costs of this expensive method of transport. The lack of animals' muscle power in tropical Africa has been felt not only in transportation, but also in farming. A dearth of draft animals in farming often meant not only a loss of muscle power, but also a dearth of fertilizer. The latter has been especially important in those parts of the continent where soils have been very much in need of fertilizer, because their low nutrient content and proneness to erosion meant that their fertility was easily exhausted by cultivation. Rainfall patterns in parts of Africa, long dry spells followed by torrential downpours, increase erosion since dry, baked soil is more easily washed away. Moreover, these torrential tropical downpours tend to leach the nutrients from the soil in Africa, as in many other tropical regions. Finally, the tropics provide a disease environment in which many more deadly diseases may flourish than in temperate zones or in mountainous tropical regions that have more temperate climates because of their heights. For example, 90% of all deaths from malaria in the world occur in sub-Saharan Africa. Even a listing of individual geographical disadvantages in Africa may understate the handicap they represent in combination. For example, the problem of poor water transportation, while serious in itself, is still more serious in combination with poor land transportation across much difficult terrain 
without the aid of pack animals. The highly variable rainfall patterns become more serious in view of where the rain falls. A geographical study of Africa found plenty of water available where it cannot be used, and a scarcity where it is most needed. Not all parts of Sub-Saharan Africa have suffered all these disabilities simultaneously. However, the fragile fertility in some regions of tropical Africa has meant that a given territory would not permanently feed people at a given location, and this in turn meant that those people had to move on every few years to find new land that would feed them, while the land they left behind recovered its fertility. Therefore, whole societies had to be mobile, foregoing the opportunities to build territorially based communities with permanent structures, such as other Africans built in more geographically favored parts of the continent, and which were common in Europe, Asia, and the Western Hemisphere. The provincialism of isolated peoples has not been peculiar to Africa. What has been peculiar to Africa are the geographic barriers to mobility that have pervaded vast areas below the Sahara. Waterways extend the boundaries of cultural interchange, but in much of sub-Saharan Africa, they did not extend those cultural boundaries very far. Like other places relatively isolated from broader cultural developments, the Scottish Highlands, parts of the Balkans, or the South Sea Islands, for example, much of sub-Saharan Africa tended to lag behind the technological, organizational, and economic progress in other parts of the world.